Now, when most of us think about building a house, we don't, most of us at least, think about getting out there and getting dirty and sweaty and bloody and swinging hammers and so forth. When we talk about building a house, we usually mean, well, spending a lot of time with a contractor and making a lot of decisions and spending a lot of time at the business end of a checkbook. That's what we usually mean. And either way, I've done it both ways, and I can tell you the checkbook way is, is much less painful than the on-hand way. And but the reason that people build their own house, whether they do it remotely or intimately, is so that they can have it their way. Long before anybody puts a shovel into the ground, long before anybody swings a hammer, you sit down with the architect and you go over the plans and you decide where you want this and where you want that. And you are the one who makes all the decisions if you're building your own house about what kind of moldings you have and what's going to be on the floor and how are the kitchen countertops going to look and what's the style for all the doors and so forth. And so at the end of this process, you have only yourself to blame for putting the hardwood in the kitchen, even though you know your propensity to drop hot liquids thereupon. How do I know this? Well, of course, you know. We build a house for ourselves so that we can have a measure of control over the outcome. And today, in our Old Testament reading, we hear David, who now is settled in Jerusalem. He's done dancing. He's brought the tabernacle into Jerusalem. And he's trying to consolidate his young kingship, his rule over the people. And he gets the idea that it may not be nice that he has this lovely house of cedar, which is to say what? a palace. He's living in a palace because he's, after all, a king. And God is living in a tent. Well, the, the Ark of the Covenant is living in a tent. And so he, he says to Nathan, you know, this doesn't seem right. And Nathan, who is a court prophet, always be careful of chaplains. They have a loyalty to the institution, and sometimes they forget about their loyalty to God, right? So Nathan says to David, hey, whatever you have in mind is a great thing because God is with you. Look, at we've had a great time with you. And then Nathan goes home and God says, hey, Nate, you know, this prophet thing, before you say, thus saith the Lord, you're supposed to ask me first. So let me tell you what I have in mind, Nathan. I haven't been in a house the whole time I've been with you. I've been in a tent. I've been moving around with you. In fact, I'm the one who has moved you. You know that pillar of fire by day, the, the cloud by night, oh, fire by night, cloud by day. What good would a cloud be at night? So I've been the one who's moved you. I've been in this tent. I haven't asked you for a house. I'll tell you what. Go and speak to my servant, David. Don't miss that, right? David the king. Who is he? Servant of God. Go and say to my servant, David, that I don't need your house. I don't want your house. I pulled you out from following a bunch of sheep, and I made you shepherd over my people. And I planted them. You don't need to give me a place. I gave you a place. That's how you got into this good and plenteous land, this land flowing with milk and honey. It's my doing. You know, I'm hard on David, and, and I'm sure you've noticed that. I, he is a wonderful leader. You know, he's the archetypal king of Israel, but he is, as we said last week, obviously a politician, and he's young in his kingship, and he wants to establish his reign as being endorsed by God. And putting a temple in Jerusalem is not just a religious act. I'm not trying to say he has no piety or that he didn't feel funny that he had a nice palace and God was living in a tent. That may very well be true, but it was greatly to his advantage to build the temple. Why? Because he's got these 12 tribes. So imagine that you have, I don't know, say a congregation like that, you know, a herd of cats, and you're trying to keep them together. And these 12 tribes of Israel, they just barely coalesce, right? They, they are always threatening to, to spin out into their own place. And especially between north and south, 
That sounds familiar. So David is down in the south in Jerusalem. And up in the north, in Shiloh and in Dan, there are alternate places of worship. And we know that this is going to continue. You remember that conversation Jesus has with the Samaritan woman at the well? And what are they talking about? Well, our ancestors said the place to worship is here on this mountain. And your ancestors said the place to worship is in Jerusalem. That conversation that Jesus has like a thousand years after David is part of what's on David's mind. That those northern tribes, they want to worship up north. And the more that they worship up north, the less they will be loyal to the king who is down south. So if he can have the Ark of the Lord ensconced permanently in a temple, that's to his advantage. David wants, in some ways, I think, to domesticate God. Now, when you hear that word domesticate, we think like wild animals made safe, right? You can bring them in and, and, and pet them, and, and you can put them in barns and make use of them. But domesticate, but you notice the root of that from Latin is domus, which is house. So we take something that is wild and we put it in the house. And God is saying clearly to David today, you can't domesticate God. You cannot hold God in a package. You cannot put God in a box. And of course, that is exactly always, always our temptation to put God in a box. We don't necessarily do it as David did by building a temple because after all, how could we? But we put him in that 10 o'clock on Sunday morning box. That's where God has to live. God is safely ensconced there, and therefore God doesn't bother me Monday through Saturday very much. I've got God all squared away Sunday morning. We put God in a box, like underneath a pavilion or in a, a building, with, with, with air conditioning, by the way, and, and lights and pews and sound system all we set up. Anyway, we put God in places in some ways because God is scary. God is dangerous. God is untamed. And we resist that because if we have God in a box, then we are the ones who are in control. We're the ones who build God a house. And God says to us, you don't have to build me a house. I'm going to plant you. I've planted God in my theology. I've planted God in my ideology. I've planted God all over the place, and God keeps wanting to roam around. Anybody ever read the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis? Yay! Okay, well, it's a wonderful story. All the kids in your life, grandkids, great-grandkids, neighbors, people who you want to accost on the street, kids who like Harry Potter, wonderful fantasy kind of a thing. Well, the Chronicles of Narnia are also a wonderful fantasy for kids and very theologically astute. And one of the characters in the Chronicles of Narnia is Aslan, who is a lion. And he's the Christ figure in this story. And he, he protects the children who are there, and he gives his life for them, and he's reborn. I told you, he's a Christ figure. And he's, he's this lion who's very attractive, but is stated very clearly in the story. Aslan is not a tame lion. Right? He is for you. And he's with you, and he loves you, and he protects you, but he is not tame. He is not your pet. And C.S. Lewis, I love that he had that insight, even to share with kids, that this God who we serve is not tame, not domesticated, not boxed in. God's not boxed in because God doesn't, God is not had by us. We are had by by God. And of course, God's having us isn't a threat. God's having us is a blessing. God doesn't just tell David, look, it, I don't need your house. He says, I'm going to make you a house. Because God likes plays on words like that, you know. You know, house of Tudor, house of Windsor, house of David. I'm going to make of you a lineage, a royal household. And so that after you die, you go to lie down with your ancestors, Others are going to rise up. And, of course, we know Solomon is going to build that temple. And we think of Jesus as the son of David, as the one who fulfills this promise that God makes to David. 
Because God's gracious promise to us is that you cannot contain me, but I want nothing more than to be resident in you. The beginning of John's Gospel, my favorite verse in John, I think, John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us is the right word there, lived in a tent among us, became flesh among us, and God promised to walk with us and be where we are in Christ, but not just there. We didn't read the epistle lesson because, after all, it's summertime, so we only read two. But let me read just a piece of what would have been the epistle lesson for today from Ephesians. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. We have been made the holy temple of God. We have been made God's tabernacle. We have the way that God moves around in the world by taking possession of us. Beloved, that's the grace of this day. We, we can't put God in a box. But God in love has chosen you and I to be the dwelling place of God. May it be so. Amen.